Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Major Histocompatibility Complex Molecules Part 2. In this video, we will finish our discussion on major histocompatibility complex molecules by talking about the pathways of antigen processing and presentation by these molecules. And towards the end of today's video, we will also talk briefly about the importance of these molecules. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So first, let's talk about the pathways of antigen processing and presentation by these molecules. First, we will provide an overview using the PowerPoint slides, and then we will explain these pathways with the help of our whiteboard. Okay, let's begin. Now, always remember, Proteins that are present in the cytosol are degraded by proteasomes and that will provide peptides that are displayed on class 1 MHC molecules. On the other hand, proteins that are ingested from the extracellular environment are sequestered in vesicles and those proteins are degraded in lysosomes or inside late endosomes and that will generate peptides that are displayed on class 2 MHC molecules. So from these two bullet points we can see a theme that is endogenous proteins or proteins that were present in the cytosol of cells. Those proteins are displayed or presented with the help of class 1 MHC molecules. And on the other hand, exogenous proteins or proteins that were ingested from extracellular environment, those proteins are displayed with the help of class 2 MHC molecules. Peptide binding to MHC molecules will occur first before they are expressed to the cell surface. So now let's talk about the class 1 pathway of antigen processing and presentation. It will occur in several steps. So first let's give an outline of these steps and then we will discuss them thoroughly. So the steps will include digestion of the cytosolic proteins by the proteasomes. The next step will be transport of the peptides that were derived due to digestion of the proteins in the proteasomes. So the second step is transport of peptides from the cytosol to the endoplasmic reticulum. The third step is assembly of peptide class 1 MHC complex. This will also occur in the endoplasmic reticulum. And the fourth step is surface expression of peptide class 1 MHC complex. So now that we have provided an outline of the steps that are involved in the class 1 pathway, now let's talk about them one by one. So first let's talk about the first step and that is digestion of cytosolic proteins by proteasomes. Now before discussing this you may have a very important question. Where do the microbial proteins that are present in the cytosol come from? And that's a very good question. So they can derive from microbes, typically viruses that can replicate in the cytosol. They can also derive from extracellular bacteria that injects proteins into the cytosol. They can also derive from antigens that were internalized into phagosomes but have escaped into the cytosol. One particular example is in case of Listeria monocytogenes. Now always remember proteins that are synthesized on free ribosomes and that are improperly folded 
those proteins are also degraded inside the proteasomes as we will see in the whiteboard and also nuclear proteins of damaged cells or tumor cells are also degraded in the proteasomes. Now you may be asking me Dr. Robiul, you are mentioning this term over and over again proteasome, proteasome, so what do we mean by proteasomes? Now always remember proteasomes are large multi-protein enzyme complex and they have a broad range of proteolytic activity. They are found in the cytoplasm and nuclei of most of the cells and they look like a cylinder that is composed of stacked array of two inner beta rings and two outer alpha rings. Okay? So each ring is composed of seven subunits with a cap-like structure at either end of the cylinder. The proteins in the outer alpha rings are structural, so they will provide structural support to proteasome. However, they do not have any proteolytic activity. And in the inner beta ring, three of the seven subunits, namely beta 1, beta 2 and beta 5, they are catalytic sites for proteolysis. So the cytosolic proteins will be digested inside the proteasomes and that will generate peptides. So that was the first step. So as you can see I have already drawn a simple diagrammatic image in the whiteboard that is denoting the class 1 MHC pathway. So this is the cytosol of the host cell and in the cytosol of this host cell we can see a virus. What will happen next? The virus will wish to replicate and in order to do that the virus will use the ribosomes of the host cell. So you can see that I have drawn several ribosomes here. This is the small subunit and this is the large subunit of a ribosome and here is another ribosome with small and large subunit and here is another one and they are reading the viral messenger RNA and by reading the viral messenger RNA they are translating viral proteins. By the way, can you recall what this type of structure is called whenever we see clusters of ribosomes that are reading a messenger RNA simultaneously? This type of structure is also known as polysomes or polyribosomes. So that's a nice thing to know. So what will happen next? So the virus is making viral proteins with the help of host ribosomes and then ubiquitin that is a small protein will attach with the viral protein. So what do we mean by ubiquitin? It is a small protein and it is ubiquitous in eukaryotic cells. Ubiquitous means everywhere. It is found in most of the eukaryotic cells and that's why it got its name ubiquitin. And the main function of these ubiquitin proteins that I have drawn in blue color is to tag the viral protein or any protein that needs to be degraded and whenever ubiquitin tags a protein that protein becomes the target of proteasome. Okay, so there will be ubiquitination of the viral proteins and whenever the viral proteins are tagged with ubiquitin, they will be targeted for degradation in the proteasomes. Moving on to the second step and the second step is transport of these peptides from the cytosol to the endoplasmic reticulum. So let's now talk about the second step. Peptides generated by proteasomes in the cytosol will be translocated in the endoplasmic reticulum by a specialized transporter. 
a dimeric protein that is located in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane will mediate this delivery and this dimeric protein is called transporter associated with antigen processing or TAP in short. So always remember this name TAP that stands for transporter associated with antigen processing. Now TAP will optimally transport peptides ranging from 8 to 16 amino acids in length. In the endoplasmic reticulum, newly synthesized class 1 MHC molecules are available to bind with the transported peptides as we will see. So this is the TAP transporter and we know that it is a dimeric protein and we can see that the viral peptides are now entering into the endoplasmic reticulum with the help of this transporter. Now, if we look carefully, we can also see that inside the endoplasmic reticulum, just besides the TAP transporter, there is the tapasin protein and the tapasin protein has affinity for MHC class 1 molecules that have empty peptide binding groove. So although we can see a peptide that is bound to this MHC class 1 molecule, for the moment just imagine that the peptide binding groove of this MHC molecule is empty and that has affinity for tapasin. So what is happening here? Viral proteins are entering through the TAP transporter. Tapasin is located very close to the TAP transporter and again tapasin has affinity for MHC class 1 molecules that have empty peptide binding groove. So all these things are done so that the viral peptides or any other cytosolic peptides can bind with the peptide binding groove of MHC class 1 molecule easily. However, there is also another thing you have to remember and that is the role of this thing, ERAP, that stands for endoplasmic reticulum resident aminopeptides. Always remember the peptides that are entering into the endoplasmic reticulum are large. So in order to make them in an appropriate size that can bind with the peptide binding groove, we will see that ERAP will degrade those peptides into smaller fragments. And now those peptide fragments can bind with the peptide binding groove of MHC class 1 molecule. So what will happen next? The third step of class 1 pathway of antigen processing and presentation is the assembly of peptide class 1 MHC complex in the endoplasmic reticulum. Class 1 alpha chains and beta 2 microglobulins are synthesized inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Membrane chaperon calnexin and luminal chaperon calreticulin will help in appropriate folding of these nascent alpha chains. Newly formed MT class 1 MHC dimers will remain linked to the TAP complex. They are waiting for peptides to come. MT class 1 MHC molecules, TAP and tapasin are part of a larger peptide loading complex. Now this is very important. In the endoplasmic reticulum there is endoplasmic reticulum resident aminopeptidase or ERAP and this will trim the peptide entering the endoplasmic reticulum through TAP as well as peptides that are produced inside the endoplasmic reticulum into appropriate size so that they can bind with the peptide binding groove of MHC class 1 molecule. 
Once class 1 MHC molecules are loaded with peptide, they no longer have the affinity for tapasin. So what will happen next? Peptide class 1 complex will be released, then it is able to exit the endoplasmic reticulum and then ultimately it will be transported to the cell surface. Now you have to remember that peptides that are transported into the endoplasmic reticulum preferentially bind with class 1 MHC molecules but not with class 2 MHC molecules despite the fact that inside the endoplasmic reticulum we also have class 2 MHC molecules. So how is this thing happening? This is a very interesting phenomena we can see that inside the endoplasmic reticulum there is both class 1 and class 2 MHC molecules but peptides that are being transported into the endoplasmic reticulum with the help of TAP transporter are preferentially binding with class 1 MHC molecules. Now this is happening due to several mechanisms. One mechanism is that newly synthesized class 1 MHC molecules are attached to the luminal aspect of the TAP complex. So as the peptides are transported inside the endoplasmic reticulum by TAP, they are rapidly captured by class 1 MHC molecules that are attached with TAP transporter with the help of tapasin protein. Another mechanism is in case of class 2 MHC molecules that are present inside the endoplasmic reticulum, the peptide binding groups of newly synthesized class 2 MHC molecules are blocked by a special protein that is called the invariant chain. So always remember this term, invariant chain. This is blocking the peptide binding groove of class 2 MHC molecules when those class 2 MHC molecules are newly synthesized inside the endoplasmic reticulum. The last step of class 1 pathway is surface expression of peptide class 1 MHC complexes. Class 1 MHC molecules with bound peptides in their peptide binding groove are structurally stable. These structurally stable peptide class 1 MHC complexes will move through the Golgi complex and ultimately they will be transported to the cell surface in exocytic vesicles. So now that we have talked about the class 1 MHC pathway of antigen processing and presentation, now let's move on and talk about the class 2 MHC pathway. So just like the class 1 pathway, class 2 pathway will occur in several steps. They will include proteolytic degradation of internalized proteins in the late endosomes and lysosomes. The next step will be binding of these peptides with class 2 MHC molecules and pay attention that this thing will happen not in the endoplasmic reticulum but in the vesicular compartments. And the third step is expression of peptide class 2 MHC complexes on the cell surface. So let's talk about these steps one by one. The first step is proteolytic degradation of internalized proteins in the late endosomes and lysosomes. Now where do the class 2 MHC associated peptides come from? That's a very good question and they derive from protein antigens that are digested in endosomes and lysosomes of antigen presenting cells. They will include extracellular proteins that were captured by endocytosis, pinocytosis or phagocytosis. They will also include cell surface proteins that are being endocytosed for degradation. 
they will also include intracellular proteins either membrane bound vesicular or cytosolic that were ingested during the process of autophagy once internalized Protein antigens become localized in intracellular membrane-bound vesicles that are called endosomes. Particulate microbes are internalized into vesicles that have a specific name and they are called phagosomes. Now, endosomal pathway of intracellular protein traffic will then communicate with lysosomes. Always remember lysosomes are denser membrane bound enzyme containing vesicles so phagosomes may fuse with lysosomes and that will produce vesicles that are called phagolysosome or secondary lysosomes internalized proteins are degraded enzymatically in late endosomes and lysosomes and this will generate peptides that can bind with the peptide binding groups of class 2 MHC molecules. But recall that this thing is happening inside late endosomes and lysosomes. But class 2 MHC molecules were synthesized inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So now we have to bring class 2 MHC molecules inside these vesicles and that is a very interesting thing. Always remember class 2 MHC molecules are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and then they are transported to endosomes with an associated protein that we have already talked about and that is the invariant chain. The next step was binding of peptide with class 2 MHC molecules and pay attention to the last two words it is happening not in the endoplasmic reticulum but inside vesicular compartments. Now regarding invariant chain we have already mentioned that invariant chain occupies the peptide binding groups of newly synthesized class 2 MHC molecules when they were inside the endoplasmic reticulum and that prevents it from accepting peptides. That's why class 2 MHC molecules cannot bind and present peptides that they encounter in the endoplasmic reticulum. Invariant chains also direct newly formed class 2 MHC molecules from the trans Golgi to late endosomes and lysosomes. Once inside the endosomal vesicles, the invariant chain dissociates from class 2 MHC molecules by the combined action of proteolytic enzymes and the HLA-DM molecule. Now peptides derived from protein antigens can bind to the available peptide binding groups of class 2 MHC molecules. The next step was expression of peptide class 2 MHC complex on cell surface. The bound peptides will stabilize class 2 MHC molecules and the stable peptide class 2 complex will be delivered to the surface of antigen presenting cells. So, as you can see in the whiteboard, I have already drawn a simple diagram that is denoting the class 2 MHC pathway of antigen processing and presentation. So, drawn in green color on the far left, we can see an exogenous protein or it may also be a particulate microorganism. So, this is internalized into the cell with the help of endocytic vesicle that we will call endosome. Now, always remember if this was particulate microbes, then we would have called that vesicle phagosome. What will happen next? Endosome will fuse with lysosome. And if that was phagosome, 
that would have also fused with lysosome and in that case we would have called this structure as phagolysosome or secondary lysosome. Okay, so what is happening inside the phagolysosome or secondary lysosome? The enzymes, the proteolytic enzymes in the lysosome will degrade this exogenous protein into peptides. Those exogenous peptides should be presented on the cell surface with the help of class 2 MHC molecules. But where are those class 2 MHC molecules? As we can see, class 2 MHC molecules are synthesized inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So we can see alpha chain, beta chain of class 2 molecules there produced inside the endoplasmic reticulum. There is a role of chaperones in this production. What will happen next? We already know that inside the endoplasmic reticulum, class 1 MHC molecules are also present and they are responsible for binding with endogenous peptides. So we don't want endogenous peptides binding with class 2 MHC molecules. And to solve that problem, we can see that after being produced in the endoplasmic reticulum, the class 2 MHC molecules, particularly the peptide binding groove of these class 2 MHC molecules, are occupied by an invariant chain. So you can see that invariant chain is now occupying the peptide binding groove of MHC class 2 molecules. So no peptide binding is happening for class 2 MHC molecules when that is inside the endoplasmic reticulum. We need this thing here inside the phagolysosome or secondary lysosome. So what is happening next? Class 2 MHC molecules with invariant chain occupying their peptide binding group is then translocated from endoplasmic reticulum via Golgi ultimately into the phagolysosome or secondary lysosome. And here what will happen, always remember that although the MHC class 2 molecules can resist lysosomal proteolytic enzymes, the invariant chain cannot. So those proteolytic enzymes of the lysosome will broken down the invariant chain and only a small remnant will be left and that is called CLIP, C-L-I-P, that stands for class 2 associated invariant chain peptide. So here we can see that the CLIP is bound to the peptide binding group of MHC class 2 molecule. But we don't want that here, right? We want these peptides that are derived from this exogenous molecule to be presented. Okay, so in order to do that, what will happen here? There will come another important thing and that is HLA-DM that I have drawn in green color. As we can see, HLA-DM has structural similarity with MHC class II molecules and HLA-DM will act as peptide exchanger. So what will happen? It will exchange this clip that was occupying the peptide binding group of the MHC class II molecule and finally the peptides that are derived from the exogenous protein can bind with the peptide binding group of MHC class II molecules. And then the MHC class II molecule with exogenous peptides bound on its peptide binding group will go to the surface and that will be expressed on the surface. So this was in short about class 2 MHC pathways. So now that we have talked about the pathways of antigen processing and presentation, now let's move on and talk about the importance of these major histocompatibility complex molecules. In this slide, we are listing 
the importance of major histocompatibility complex molecules. Antigen recognition by T cells is dependent on association of those antigens with either class 1 or class 2 MHC molecules. And we had talked about this in our previous video when we were talking about MHC restriction. The second bullet point is also denoting a very important point. Many autoimmune diseases may occur in individuals who are carrying certain MHC genes. We will talk more about this bullet point shortly afterwards. And the last importance of MHC molecules is that success of organ transplant depends on compatibility of MHC molecules of the donor and recipient. So in this table we can see a list that is denoting autoimmune diseases that are associated with individuals who are carrying certain HLA genes. For example, rheumatoid arthritis can occur predominantly in individuals who are carrying the HLA-DR4 gene. Systemic lupus erythematosus can occur predominantly in individuals who are carrying DR2, DR3. Similarly, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus may occur predominantly in individuals who are carrying HLA-DR3, DR4 gene. Multiple sclerosis can happen predominantly in individuals who are carrying HLA-DR2 gene. Ankylosing spondylitis, inflammatory bowel disease, reactive arthritis, psoriasis. These autoimmune diseases are common in individuals who are carrying HLA-B27. Graves disease can happen in individuals who are carrying HLA-B8. Celiac disease can occur in individuals who are carrying HLA-DQ2 or DQ8. But one thing you have to remember, if a person, say for example, is carrying DR4 gene, not all of them will develop rheumatoid arthritis. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it should be noted that whether a person develops an autoimmune disease or not is multifactorial. Now, one thing you have to remember in general, class 2 MHC related diseases will occur more commonly in women and class 1 MHC related autoimmune diseases will occur more commonly in men. So this concludes our video on major histocompatibility complex molecules. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to know more. Okay, that's all for today. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.